Hello, everyone. Welcome to our event on beauty and science and interdisciplinary conversation. It is uh, a great delight to see you all here. I'm Brandon Vaidinathan, a uh, sociologist from the Catholic University of America, and uh, along with my friend and colleague, uh, Professor Rob Gilbert here at Maudlin College. I'm uh, really delighted to welcome you to this event on beauty and science. Um, we're going to get started today with a series of uh, very brief presentations on a uh, topic that has been addressed from a variety of perspectives. Uh, it's been my pleasure to follow this conversation as a sociologist, uh, reading the work of philosophers and scientists and trying to then figure out to what extent these perspectives are represented in the scientific community. And so you'll hear uh, the, the perspectives of uh, scientists from a variety of disciplines, mathematics and medicine, uh, philosophy, uh, physics, biology, and then, and then what I offer is a sociological analysis of the distribution of some of these perspectives. Uh, across these fields. So, so we'll start with Ben MacArthur talking about truth and beauty in physics and biology, uh, then James McAllister on beauty and theory in science, uh, Milena Ivanova, beauty and experiment in science, Robert Gilbert talking about beauty, beauty in nature and in data, uh, Zabina Hassenfelder talking about how beauty leads physics astray, and then finally I will talk about an empirical assessment of this work on beauty and science. So to briefly introduce our speakers before we begin, Dr. Ben MacArthur is our first speaker and he is Director of AI for Science and Government and Deputy Program Director for Health and Medical Sciences at the Alan Turing Institute. He's also a professor in the Faculty of Medicine and the School of Mathematical Sciences at the University of Southampton. Dr. James McAllister is Professor of History and Philosophy of Science at Leiden University and is the author of Beauty and Revolution in Science. Dr. Milena Ivanova is Bi Fellow at Fitzwilliam College, at the University of Cambridge. She's a co editor of The Aesthetics of Science Beauty, Imagination, and Understanding, published by Rutledge in 2020, and author of Duham and Holism, published in 2021 by Cambridge University Press. She's currently co editing a book on the aesthetic nature of scientific experiments. Uh, fortunately, she's not feeling well. She's been uh, hit by a pretty bad case of COVID, so she'll join us virtually. Dr. Robert Gilbert is Professor of Biophysics in the Nuffield Department of Medicine and Director of the University of Oxford, uh, Oxford Medical Sciences Graduate School. He's also the author of Science and the Truthfulness of Beauty. Uh, Dr. Sabina Hassenfelder is Research Fellow at the Frankfurt Institute for Advanced Studies. She's the author of Lost in Math, How, Beautiful, How Beauty Leads Physics Astray published in 2018 by Basic Books, and a brand new book, Existential Physics, The Scientist's Guide to Life's Biggest Questions, that's coming up next month, right? Uh, she's also creative director of the really popular YouTube channel, Science Without the Gobbledygook. Finally, I'm Brandon Badinathan, I'm Associate Professor and Chair of Sociology at the Catholic University of America. Uh, I've written some books, but um, not that interesting. For this particular discussion, I've been doing a project on the role of beauty in science for the last few years. And it's been my great pleasure to read these great scholars, their work, and to bring them together for this event. So, without further ado, we'll get started with Ben MacArthur uh, talking about uh, truth and beauty in physics and biology. Now, I, I get a uh, text message by someone saying, I have no images. Is that my fault? I'm not really sure. But, uh, if, if, if you all who are watching online have no access to uh, slides, just let us know. If you have any trouble, we'll try to figure it out. But in the meantime, we'll get started with our presentation here. I want to give you a, a really short CV. This is not because I, I think that you'll be particularly interested in my CV, but it has some bearing on what I want to say later on. So let me just take you very quickly through where I've come from. I started off as a mathematician, and as an undergraduate, I would have said that I was interested in pure mathematics. I felt that pure mathematics was like the queen of the, sci the, qu queen of the sciences. Uh, it was the, the highest state of knowledge, if you like. So I started off with that kind of mindset, and gradually, as I began to study mathematics, I became more and more interested in, in applied mathematics, so using mathematical models to describe the real world. And so I went on to do a PhD in applied mathematics, 
Uh, in fact, it was in mathematical biology, so I was interested in mathematical, bio, uh, mathematical modeling of biological systems. I felt at the end of that that the mathematics that I was doing was not really speaking to the biologists in, in the way that I wanted it to. So at that point, I did a postdoc, and amazingly, I was given a job as an experimentalist in a lab doing some ex cell biology experiments. Um, I wouldn't say that I was converted to becoming a biologist, but I spent a long time working on experiments and working with biologists in that context. I actually did a second postdoc where I was trying to bring those two strands of thought uh, more closely together. And then eventually I got an academic position and my current position is a joint position between the Faculty of Medicine and the School of Mathematics. So I'm attempting to bring these two ways of thinking uh, together. And so I have some experience in both of them. And I wanted to try and share with you some of my thoughts about that experience. So let's just, I'd like to start at the beginning and I'm going to give you some quotes to kind of illustrate where I'm coming from. So this is a famous mathematician, G.H. Hardy. He spent uh, most of his time in Cambridge, but some time here in Oxford. And so he said this, he was a pure mathematician. Beauty is the first test. There is no permanent place in the world for ugly mathematics. And I think this is such an interesting quote. I think it's really interesting because it says, well, there is a kind of immortality. There is a, a, a something eternal. And that thing that is eternal is mathematical, but it's not just mathematical, it's beautiful mathematics in some way. So his belief really was that beauty was the first test. So if you're a pure mathematician, really that's what you're looking for. Elegance, harmony, simplicity, if you like, in your theories. And there's no place for ugly mathematics. It might be right in the sense that it's a, a workable proof, but it's not right in the sense that it's a good piece of mathematics. So that kind of idea really permeates lots of uh, pure mathematical thinking. Um, I was really, really interested in pure mathematics for a long time. This is another picture of Paul Ergis, a very, very famous 20th century mathematician. He had this idea that God has a celestial book. And in this book are written the purest, most elegant proofs. And so his highest compliment to someone was to say, well, this one is from the book, capital T, capital B. Um, he said, you don't have to believe in God, but you should believe in the book. So somehow this is really what we're striving for, this kind of elegance, this kind of uh, beauty in our work. And that kind of thinking really permeates lots of mathematics in my experience. Um, and because lots of physicists come from that kind of mathematical background, it starts to permeate the way in which lots of physicists think as well. So this, of course, is Richard Feynman, a hugely influential physicist. And he said this, you can recognize truth and truth by beauty and simplicity. Inexperienced students make guesses that are very complicated and it sort of looks like it's all right. But I know that it's not true because the truth always turns out to be simpler than you thought. So if you're a young physicist, coming to physics or coming to uh, mathematics and you hear the greats like this say if you think it's complicated you're getting it wrong you're an inexperienced student well you don't want to think that think that of yourself do you you want to think that you're a sophisticated student so these kind of statements are enormously influential in mathematics and enormously influential in theoretical physics um, and so this kind of permeates the way in which lots of us think about uh, theory in particular. Now, as I began to have more and more exposure to biologists, I realized that they really don't see things like that at all. So this is a quote from Richard Preston. He's actually a journalist. He writes for the New Yorker. And he said, in biology, nothing is clear. Everything is too complicated. Everything is a mess. And just when you think you understand something, you peel off a layer and find deeper complications beneath. Nature is anything but simple. And so the sort of counterpoint to this very pure way of thinking, this mathematically led way of thinking, does, doesn't really feature so prominently in the biological sciences. In fact, in the biological sciences, things are enormously complicated. They're rich, you would say. There's diversity, there are, and there's great beauty in that diversity. And so biologists would generally cherish that kind of complexity, that kind of beauty, that kind of feeling that the world is very, very complicated. And as we peel off one layer, we we just get down to more and more depth, more and more complexity. So as I began to work more and more with biologists, I began to feel that this kind of feeling was certainly more present in the biological science community than in the physics community. Now, that doesn't, that's not a, um, that of course, it's a generality. Not everybody thinks like that. But in general, there seems to be this kind of um, feelings amongst the biological uh, sciences community. Now, of course, 
you can bring those two uh, feelings together. This is a quote from the very end of uh, uh, The Origin uh, from Darwin. And he says, there is grandeur in this way of life. From so simple a beginning, endless forms, most beautiful and wonderful, have been and are being evolved. So there is a kind of interplay between some simple driving principles and the complexity that we observe in the real world. But... Um, it's not such a sharp dichotomy as you would see in, in, the, in the physical sciences. As I began to move more and more into the experimental sciences, I was really, really interested in interdisciplinary research. You know, how can we bring together different communities? How can we bring biological scientists alongside mathematicians, say, to work collaboratively? And I kind of began to, I wanted to really dissect why that, what, why it's so difficult to do that. And so, of course, at the very top, if you imagine the sort of layers of depth going deeper and deeper and deeper, trying to understand why we have these different ways of thinking. Well, obviously, the biological sciences and the physical sciences are generally um, interested in quite distinct problems. You, there is an intersection, of course, with biophysics, but often they're very uh, different interests. Because they come from different places, they have different histories, and those different his histories mean that they use different languages to describe the real world. And some of that language is overloaded. So the term model, for instance, has numerous different meanings depending on who is saying it. So those, if you like, are relatively superficial differences that could be overcome, but more deeper than that, they come from slightly different perspectives on the real world. In general, Bio uh, biological sciences, in my experience, are more interested with the sort of here and now diversity of the real world rather than some abstracted realm. So they have a kind of different uh, philosophical underpinning. But below that, I would argue, there is this different conception of what is attractive, what is desirable in science. And from the mathematical side of things, we would think about this sort of pristine world of elegance. And on the biological side of things, we would think about complexity and abundance and so forth. So I began to feel that perhaps at that bottom level, that was one of the main difficulties with bring, bringing the communities together. So having said all that, I wanted to share with you four thoughts. And these are just my thoughts, really, that I don't hold them very uh, tightly, if you like. They're just, just open as if you like to kick off a discussion. So my first thought is that feelings of beauty and wonder and awe, they're really innate responses to the natural world and they're primary motivators of our investigation of it. Everybody is seeking something attractive. That, the definition of what is attractive might vary from person to person, but that is a primary motivator for us. That's important because what we find beautiful or attractive determines the questions we ask and the answers that we consider plausible. So it's important that it even determines the questions that you would ask. So if you were interested in an answer that, that was mathematically elegant, you would ask a question that's likely to lead you to that. If you were interested in the abundance and complexity of life, you would, you would ask questions that will lead you to that. So it's very important because it kind of hits to the root of uh, the kinds of things that we, the kinds of questions that we might ask as scientists. The third one is that our perceptions and our perceptions of beauty are conditioned by our biology and thereby our place in the natural world. So the way in which we think is determined by our biology. So the way that we perceive the world is determined by our biology. So what we find attractive in the world is determined by our biology. So for instance, in my opinion, if we're ever to come to a grand unified theory of anything, we have to account for the fact that the ones doing the theorizing have a particular biology and a particular place in the natural world. And then finally, um, I would argue that science is the process of exploring the world as it is, not as we would like it to be. So beauty can be a great guide for us and it can spur us on to looking into the natural world. And beauty can help with us in that, but we shouldn't be dogmatic, of course. This is a picture of, does anyone know what this is a picture of, this dog? <laughs> Dogmatics. Yeah. Dogmatics from Asterix, yeah. So I feel that we have to cultivate a view of the world that allows for all of these diverse perspectives, including diverse opinions of what is beautiful. So I'll finish there. Thank you. That's brilliant. Thank you, Ben. Um, it's a great way to kick off our discussion today. Um, next, I'm going to have James... 
Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, uh, thanks very much to, to Brandon for organizing this uh, meeting and uh, everyone, uh, uh, to, for, to every one of you for, for turning up. Uh, it's a slightly warm afternoon, but uh, the, the topics are even hotter, so uh, uh, you've come to the right place. So it's a very great pleasure uh, uh, to be able to, to talk to you for about uh, 10 minutes on the beauty and uh, theory in science. And the first thing that I'd like to say is that... Um, the topic that we're dealing with, the topic that the first speaker dealt with, the topic that will uh, uh, entertain us and, and, and intrigue us for the rest of uh, this afternoon, uh, is both a very ancient topic and a very modern topic. And it's an ancient topic because it goes back to some of the foundations of uh, uh, Western philosophy, I think. Um, uh, much of ancient thought uh, posited uh, a unity of, of the virtues, uh, the, the, uh, the beautiful, the true, and the good. Uh, you see that in various different manifestations. One of uh, the manifestations that's best known uh, is um, uh, the, uh, the way in which in Homer, for example, you can tell in many respects uh, the character of uh, the, the, the person that Homer is talking about from their physical appearance. And so all the best people are not only uh, righteous and, uh, and act well and, and, and are fair and so on, but they're also strikingly beautiful, uh, the, uh, the beautiful goddesses and the handsome heroes. Um, this might seem like a reference to a, a far distant uh, conception of the universe, but in fact, I think it still holds uh, sway uh, today, and even in today's uh, science. Um, uh, what, what my delight has happened over the past uh, uh, couple of decades, and especially over the past uh, year or two, is that this topic has moved from, as we might call it, myth uh, to true science and to true scholarly investigation. Uh, as long as you're happy to talk about uh, the beautiful goddesses and the handsome uh, heroes, as long as you're happy to talk about uh, somewhat mystical uh, connections between the beautiful and, and the true, uh, you don't get very fine scholarship. It's very difficult to make uh, uh, concrete points. It's very difficult difficult to, to, to put forward any claims that are actually testable and that have a relationship to, to the world that we see in front of us. Um, but once you start um, applying scholarly studies, scholarly approaches to the topic, uh, a number of mysteries either dissolves or evaporates uh, or, or uh, uh, becomes uh, much clearer. Uh, and in this uh, brief talk, I want to mention two approaches uh, that are uh, represented, I think, in, uh, in the, today's uh, panel, uh, to um, deal in a scholarly way, in a truly scientific way, I'm tempted to say, uh, with this otherwise slightly amorphous uh, topic. And the first of these is, of course, uh, social science. Um, and I want to illustrate the passage from myth uh, to scholarly study uh, in the social sciences by juxtaposing these two images as if, as if they were two icons uh, of the discussion of the relationship between the truth and beauty and aesthetic factors in science uh, under the heading of myth and under the heading of a fully scientific uh, social science. On the left-hand side, you see the seal of the extremely prestigious uh, Institute for, for Advanced Study in Princeton, founded in uh, 1930. Uh, and the design of the seal uh, took um, inspiration from uh, classical motifs, and you see the personification of uh, truth and beauty intertwined uh, and in, in case the, uh, um, this classical classicist message doesn't come, off, uh, come across uh, strongly enough, also the words truth and beauty are uh, placed uh, in, in the seal just to drive the message home. So this is a, the suggestion, an intriguing su suggestion, that truth and beauty in science are somehow uh, connected, but it remains at the level of myth. It's intriguing, it's exciting, it makes you, uh, makes you excited perhaps, it motivates you, but you really have no idea what's going on. And on the right-hand side, you see the, the process of scientification, if you like, of this uh, situation, of this, of this, uh, uh, this line of thinking. Um, you see here the cover page uh, of um, the first uh, findings regarding aesthetics of science of Brandon's extremely famous um, uh, uh, um, uh, research uh, project, a very wide-ranging uh, wide uh, 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 research project in empirical sociology. Uh, under the general heading of work and well-being in science. And I've no doubt that when Brandon takes the floor at the end of uh, today's session, we'll be hearing much more about that. Uh, but you guessed it from Brandon's own introduction of me. I am not a social scientist. I am a philosopher and a philosopher of science. So to some extent, I'm tempted to say, I think I have to say, Brandon, even social science doesn't have the solution to, to everything. And I, I, I tend to think that we can go even further in a sense um, drawing on uh, Brandon's uh, results and other results in social science and move to a philosophical plane. And the situation, the, the, the thing that really uh, stimulates the move to philosophy is this, it's the normative question. As you probably know, philosophy 
is um, interested, of course, in getting the facts right. Every scientific and scholarly discipline does that. But we're in also interested often in philosophy in talking about the warrants, the justification, the normative aspects of science, how to get things right, uh, how, to, um, uh, how to do things the right way, not just getting the facts right, but also getting our processes right and our opinions uh, uh, right. And so we know from Brandon's work and uh, many other statements uh, in, in science, some of which have been uh, cited by the, uh, the first uh, speaker, that science um, finds motivation and delight in beauty. Beauty delights and motivates uh, science uh, scientists. But there's a, a deeper question. Does beauty also hold uh, the key to good science? Is beauty a road to truth? Is beauty a way of identifying truths uh, of uh, formatting truths, for example. There are many intriguing suggestions, once again, which, again, we're trying to move from myth to, to scholarly study. Uh, many uh, items of testimony uh, from scientists uh, on, along these uh, lines, the, the former speaker mentioned one. I decided to choose uh, some testimony from Oxford, uh, a fellow of Wadham, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Roger Penrose. I'll just read out this uh, short quote. It is a mysterious thing, in fact, how something which looks attractive may have a better chance of being true than something which looks ugly. I've noticed on many occasions in my own work where there might, for example, be two guesses that could be made as to the solution of a problem. So often it turns out that the more attractive possibility is the true one. So I think we can all agree that if this were the case, then this would form a powerful motivation for scientists. We would, we would be motivated to do science, motivated to try and do good science by the aesthetic aspects of, of the topic or of our theories. But what, there's another suggestion that comes across in Penrose's uh, passage here. That's that uh, beauty is um, a, a diagnostic criterion, if you like. It's something that can reveal truths. And, and that's a much stronger view um, and it's also a view that uh, it, it turns out to have a normative uh, characteristic because it deals with what it is to do good science. We need to find an explanation. If we, I, I, I contend if we're going to do a scholarly work on this topic as, a, as on any other, it's one thing simply to be amazed by uh, quotations such as the ones that I've just given you to find them intriguing and so on. But we need to do more than that. We need actually to find explanations. Um, and so the, the question that I've uh, posed myself for a number of years is um, what could explain this actually quite puzzling coincidence? What could explain the fact that scientists find theories close to the truth aesthetically attractive? If we accept what Penrose say, then, says, then this is one of the features that we see in scientific uh, practice. And what could explain this coincidence? It's not at all obvious that this uh, uh, coincidence should come about. You can easily imagine a possible world in which scientists systematically find attractive theories that show certain characteristics but are not close to the truth. That would, of course, complicate scientific practice a great deal. But if this coincidence holds, then what, what are explanations for them? There are many possible explanations. I'm going to limit myself uh, to two. Uh, the first explanation might be regarded by a philosopher, something like a Platonist, maybe even a Pythagorean, uh, account of uh, our beauty in science. And that's the idea that it's necessarily the case, it's necessarily true um, that we find the truth aesthetically attractive. There's something about the harmony, for example, between um, our, our brains or our minds and the world in such a way that if a theory is true, we, we necessarily find that theory aesthetically uh, attractive. I don't think this explanation holds water for a very simple historical reason. Philosophers um, uh, are willing to use a prior arguments, but they're also interested in uh, what, what's historically the case. Um, and historical evidence, evidence from the history of science, suggests that scientists' aesthetic preferences have changed in time. Just to give you a very quick example, uh, there's now much less uh, aesthetic revulsion felt by uh, theoretical physicists at quantum uh, mechanics than there was for a few years after the mid-1920s, uh, when mature quantum mechanics uh, came into being. And so this shows uh, an evolution of scientists' canons and, and preferences among the aesthetic aspects uh, of their theories. And so th there's much more to be said about this. I can't uh, in 10 minutes uh, uh, cover all the, all, the, all the terrain, but this is my primary objection for this afternoon against this, further, this first uh, explanation. If we reject this first explanation, then we need a second one, and with the second explanation, I'm, I'm kind of putting the thing on its head. It's not the case that there is such a thing as um, a beauty and that's connected necessarily uh, to truth. 
It's more that the empirical success of theories, the empirical success that a theory that's close to the truth will, will typically uh, demonstrate, is partly responsible for our finding uh, such theories aesthetically attractive. There's, there's uh, something about the, um, the empirical success, the empirical performance of a good theory that uh, retunes, recalibrates our aesthetic preferences as scientists and, and, and uh, uh, um, kind of tunes our aesthetic preferences to just those features that at the moment seem to be correlated with good empirical performance uh, in, in scientists. And I think we can agree that this would make the coincidence less surprising. It would remove a lot of the mysterious aspects of, of this coincidence. That's what you want, of course, in, in scholarly um, work. If you are talking about myth, it's very nice to have surprising, astonishing coincidences. But in scholarly work, perhaps prosaically, we try to uh, stamp those out in a way. We try, to, uh, we try to find the mechanisms that underlie apparently strange coincidence. And, and it turns out in may, very many cases, of course, that these aren't coincidences at all, but they are the product of certain uh, mechanisms and certain uh, structures which we haven't uh, initially uh, identified. Now, an inductive process would ensure this. An inductive process, that's a form of uh, learning by example, learning by experience. Um, if we think that empirical performance uh, shapes our way of thinking, then my mind at any rate immediately goes to inductive processes, uh, learning by uh, induction. And that's why about 25 years ago, I put forward a, a hypothesis about the ways in which uh, scientists, uh, psychologists, if you like, uh, were, were shaped and affected by the experience that they have in their work as scientists um, in identifying theories that have um, uh, empirically successful uh, track records, have, have empirically successful empirical, um, successful empirical performances. Um, I dubbed this the aesthetic induction, um, and it's a mechanism that explains why, um, uh, even though at, 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 at an early stage a scientist might find a theory that's just been uh, formulated, especially if it's an iconoclastic theory, such as quantum mechanics, aesthetically repulsive, um, nonetheless, those, uh, the preferences of uh, those scientists on the aesthetic uh, plane are worn down, if you like, by the uh, continuing empirical performance or continuing empirical successes of those theories until eventually the scientist comes to uh, accept that those theories are aesthetically attractive. Why do they come to accept that? Well, because the scientist's own preferences have evolved uh, according to this process of um, uh, inductive uh, learning that I've dubbed uh, the aesthetic uh, induction. And so this leads me to the conclusion of this extremely short uh, talk. Um, I think in the course of uh, this afternoon's panel, we're going to see two complementary uh, approaches uh, at work. Uh, I think it's certainly fair to say that uh, social science, empirical social science, quantitative social science, can ascertain the motivating force of aesthetic factors. Uh, do all scientists feel this force? How strong is this force? All sorts of things that uh, Brandon will be talking to us about uh, a little bit later. Philosophy, on the other hand, that's my own discipline, of course, uh, it's able to investigate the link of these aesthetic factors, which things that really, if you don't mind me saying, Brandon, don't show up on the social scientists' uh, radar. And those are things like rationality, objectivity, and truth. These are typically epistemological, typically philosophical uh, concepts. And so it, it's up to, I think, the philosophers among us to uh, try to establish, try to ascertain or investigate the connection between uh, beauty and truth in, in, under this heading, in this, in this uh, framework. And for what it's worth, I, I still believe, even after 25 years, that my inductive account explains uh, why scientists' aesthetic tastes are, are tuned uh, to properties connected uh, with truth. But induction being what it is, uh, this connection is fallible and so can sometimes lead us uh, astray, which I suspect might be another topic that we'll hear more about later on this afternoon. Thanks very much, and I hope you enjoy the rest of uh, this symposium. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone who is watching online, who is in Oxford. Thank you so much to Brandon for inviting me to be part of this panel. It's a great honor to be in such amazing company. Very sorry not to be there in person. COVID was a lot more of a struggle than I expected but very pleased to be able to still join the conversation and explore the aesthetics of scientific experiments. So I'm interested in understanding whether experiments in science can be objects of aesthetic appreciation. And the questions that we're going to 
think about today is whether we can appreciate an experiment for aesthetic reasons, whether we can find, for instance, an experiment beautiful. What would be the focus of this appreciation? What would it mean to say that an experiment is beautiful? What would we actually focus on? And whether there is any stability in how we appreciate aesthetically. This is exactly leading from where James just left us arguing that there is dynamicity in how we understand beauty in science and we see these continuities in science. So how is this to be understood when we think about experimental practice and how much it has changed historically? So I'm going to start by presenting this uh, distinction here. Well, many ways in which we can appreciate aesthetically an experiment we can, we can appreciate the phenomena that the experiment reveals to us, the instruments that we are using. We can also think about the performance of the experiment itself as a, something we appreciate aesthetically. This is particularly prominent in earlier experimental traditions where the experiment was practiced as a performance in front of audiences. Um, we also appreciate design of an experiment and that will be really important to my argument the very process of conceptualizing a design and a setup for an experiment is also subject to aesthetic judgment and can be appreciated aesthetically. And finally, the results. So let me just give a few examples of all this to illustrate it. So first, the phenomenon. This is just a few examples of the kind of amazing things you can see under a microscope if you're in the lab and doing an experiment, but also the kind of instruments you can see uh, if you are, well, depending on which kind of experimental tradition you're part of, the first to the left and to the right, the third picture are from some instruments that we house here in the University of Cambridge in the History and Philosophy of Science department. And they're very clearly, aesthetically very pleasing to look at. They used to be, of course, used. And uh, the experiment in the middle is the pit drop experiment, which I used to pass by every day on the way to work at the University of Queensland. And that's one of the kind of very public experiments and it resembles very much the kind of performative experiences and experiments that used to be more a uh, part of scientific practice. But we can see that the instruments themselves can be very pleasing. And the performance of the experiment can be very much, very much analogous to artistic performance. And here in this famous painting by Joseph Wright of Derby, this is very well illustrated. Um, this is an experiment that was performed with a new instrument, the air pump, and in the early days of the Royal Society, the experiment used to be very much a focal point of appreciation for specific reasons. So it will have audiences where people engage with the experiment and appreciate it, and often appreciate nature as it's revealed to them. And this painting is brilliant because it shows us how many different ways people appreciated aesthetically the experiment from awe and fascination to even fear and, and all of the kind of the diversity of aesthetic responses that would have to the fact that this bird is going to die because we're extracting the oxygen from the cylinder. Um, so the performance is aesthetically appreciated here in the experiment is like an artist in the middle of the painting. But what I have argued in some of my work recently is that these features are kind of like a nice bonus to have, right? So they're visual features that are, that are very kind of easily perceivable to us. Um, but they're neither necessary or sufficient to make an experiment aesthetically valuable or to make it beautiful. We're going to talk more about beauty today. Um, what really matters is this very special relationship between how the design delivers a result and the kind of imagination and creativity, ingenuity that is involved in conceiving such an experimental design. So let me illustrate this a little bit more. In one of these uh, famous experiments, uh, Foucault's pendulum, uh, we see this really well illustrated. It was an experiment that clearly had some very visually uh, pleasing features. It was uh, basically a brass ball that was hung from a rope in uh, Paris's Pantheon and people would go to see it. As you can see here, there was always an audience admiring it, beautiful uh, pendulum swinging around. But what's beautiful about this experiment has nothing to do with that. I mean, okay, very nice that we can see something visually pleasing, but what is really ingenious about it is how simple the experimental design is for the purpose that it had and the significance that it had. The significance is really uh, important. The, the, this experiment with this very simple setup shows something very um, 
previously disputed, and that was that the Earth rotates around its axis. And uh, the experiment delivered that by simply showing that after some time of this pendulum swinging, uh, the sand underneath, the lines that the ball had made were not aligned with each other. So really important result delivered by a very elegant, very simple design. And this is what I think makes this experiment beautiful. The visual features are kind of secondary to this much more substantial beauty that we find in how the results are delivered by a very, very good design for purpose. Similarly, uh, in biology, we celebrate the Meson star experiment because it delivered important results to a really, really important question, and it delivered them in a really ingenious way. So this, this experiment has received the title of the most beautiful experiment in biology for good reason. Um, as historian Hans-Peter Fischer has argued, there was something really ingenious about how the experimental design was was Baelic City set up, um, beautiful idea to use uh, basically the method of centrifugation, to use density, to study the genetic material for the generations as they did in order to determine how it changed. And there was some simplicity as historian uh, uh, Frederick Holmes argues in this setup, in the steps that they followed. So simple, elegant design, but the results that the experiment delivered were also incredibly significant. James Watson, one of the discoverers of the um, double helix structure of DNA, argued that this experiment was ingenious because it gave a simple answer to a question. We treat this experiment as an example of a crucial experiment in science because it delivers these really important, straightforward, easy results. Right? It's not a messy result. It's really quite clear, speaking in favor of one of the three contenders at the time of how DNA would replicate same conservatively the answer was. And Peter Fisher argues again that this, the experimental results just spoke for themselves. There was no need to replicate them. Uh, no further commentary was necessary. And um, Holmes argued that there was this immediateness about them, that there was a single historic event. We didn't have to worry to redo these experiments many times. Of course, recognizing that that's quite unusual, but that was one of the aspects that was really valued about how the experiment delivered its results. And what's worthwhile noting here is that so far we have these two experiments as examples of beautiful experiments that clearly delivered an answer to a question and delivered an answer to a question that aligns with expectation. Right in the first case, we have a demonstration of a phenomenon that was expected. And here we had the selection of a hypothesis among three contenders at the time, aligning against the expectation. Sometimes things don't go like that though. In science, we have sometimes experimental results that will not align with expectations. So the question is what happens there? Are they then making the experiment aesthetically disvalued? We can think about the Michelson Morley experiment as an example of something like this and how it has been praised by scientists as a very beautiful experiment. Albert Einstein himself argued that Michelson was an artist in science, the artist in science, right? Really highly praised for his aesthetic sensibility, who took great pleasure and great joy in uh, the beauty of the experimental setup and the elegance of the method that he employed. And historian Gerald Holton argued again about the ingenuity of just setting up the experiment and building the instruments necessary to achieve the goal of the experiment. Nobody before Michelson was able to imagine and construct an apparatus to measure the second order effects of the presumed ether drift. He argues that the interferometer was a lovely thing. So what happens in these cases where we have results that don't necessarily align quite with expectation, but are really well set up for purpose? I think we should understand them still as beautiful, but understand the, na the nature of significance in a slightly different way. So by significance of results, we can think about them as going our way when we have a demonstration of a, of a phenomenon or confirmation of discovery. But also sometimes we have these disruptive the results are really productive. Not every null result will be like that. But sometimes, like in this case, with the ether not detecting the ether, actually was what was significant and what was really good about this, this result, this experiment. And so I've argued that 
we should really think about disrupt, this kind of productive disruption as part of being a significant result and that makes an experiment really beautiful by the kind of significance it had in revising beliefs, opening conversation and reconsidering fundamental assumptions that are being made. If an experiment can do something like that, that also should be considered as part of being significant and well-made for purpose. So the framework I'm suggesting here argues for the following things, that experiments can elicit aesthetic responses. These can be very pleasing, but sometimes dis disturbing as well. And that's very an analogous to how we appreciate artworks. Not every appreciation of an artwork is pleasing or is simply appreciation of beauty as, as something that's very easy to process. Sometimes they are disruptive as well. I've argued that the visual features are really nice to have sometimes. But they're not essential for us appreciating an experiment as beautiful. The, the beauty judgments really pertain to how the design and the significance of the results are intertwined and how they reveal ingenuity in the setup of, of this kind of appropriate design for purpose. And I think I want to kind of go back to uh, what James was arguing just 10 minutes before about the fact that we can change the way we experience beauty in science. Clearly, experimental results and experimental setups today are very different. How we, how we get to our results is very different. We use machines. The setups are very different. Very big machines, very big detectors. Nothing to do with the 70th century experimental setups that we see, the tabletop experiments. The experiments look so different. They're practiced so differently. So how can we talk then about having some kind of notion that employs to all of these particular setups, I think thinking about beauty as a functional notion will help to see that we can still praise that kind of relationship between design for purpose, even if we recognize that the setups are very different. So how will we actually materialize a really good design for purpose will definitely be changing depending on the kind of area that we're studying and the, and the kind of setup that is available to us. But this, I think, can maybe unify the different ways in which we practice experimentally. So this is from me. Thank you very much for your attention. And I look forward to the rest of the talks. Thank you, Brandon. And it's lovely to be here. Um, as Brandon says, I'm going to talk about nature and data and beauty in those. And for me, uh, as also for colleagues that I work with, nature and data come together under under the topic of biophysics. And what I'm going to say, um, happily, is going to follow on nicely from the previous three presenters. So, and, and in, in terms of what I want to talk about, I'm actually going to group the points I want to make, which, as I say, come very much from my personal point of view under a series of more general terms, which you will find used in all sorts of other kinds of discourse, um, uh, because I think they are helpful ways to think about the kinds of applications of perceptions of beauty that are going on in these different areas of science. And the first thing I'm going to talk about is a couple of examples of idealism. This also happily follows on from Mylena because this actually relates to the measles and style experiment that she was talking about. So on the left-hand side of the screen, you see a famous cartoon drawn by uh, Watson and Crick for their paper published in 1953 describing the structure of DNA. And if you read that paper, a very short paper, which you'll be able to find on the Nature website, I'm sure you, perhaps you've all read it, you will remember if you've read it, or you'll find if you go and read it, that it's framed very much in ideal terms. It's very much about what would be neat given the data we've got. There were certain bits of information they had, but they needed to put them together into a satisfying whole, and they came up with the double, the double helix uh, hypothesis, uh, which turned out to be entirely correct, essentially, and which leads on, of course, on the right-hand side to the experimentally determined structures um, for DNA itself, and uh, the more complicated RNA, which has a because of because of a particular chemical modification in ribose compared to deoxyribose has a much more complex range of, of folding patterns. Um, but the, at the core, the core idea that Watson and Crick came up with was correct, that base pairing leads to the double helix. The reason it relates to um, Mylena's uh, talk is, and to the Measles and Stahl experiment is that, again, very famously at the end of the 1953 paper, um, and sort of with their tongue in their cheek, Watson and Crick said, it has not escaped our notice that this structure suggests a possible mechanism for the replication of DNA. And of course, their mechanism was exactly the, the mechanism which Measles and Stahl uh, went on to show was correct the semi-conservative hypothesis for DNA replication. So that was an idealistic process. Idealism too here is to get another example of, um, which is 
in this case relates to symmetry, I guess, as does the DNA example. Um, also, Watson and Crick um, in 1956 published again in Nature a paper describing what they thought the structures of small viruses would be like, and they needed to solve the problem of how it is that you can enclose a genome with a protein that it's encoded, and this is a, a basic problem to do with the size of the molecules. And they came up with some simple ideas about how you could essentially organize triangles in order to generate um, closed structures which would enclose uh, the genomes of viruses. Um, they did it perhaps informed by knowledge about the platonic solids, which you can see some ancient um, dice down below replicating those, the five platonic solids, of which the one which gets the most complex structure with the simplest shape is the icosahedron, and that was indeed what they proposed would be the structure of small viruses. And this is essentially as a theoretical paper by Watson and Crick, which turns out when you solve the structure of viruses like the blue tongue virus or any number of other isometric viruses, um, and this was a, a paper published, uh, as you can see, 25 years ago or so by some colleagues of mine uh, here in Oxford. The blue tongue virus, 100 million Daltons, the largest structure to be solved at the time, uh, 720 copies of one protein forming out of shell, 120 copies of another protein forming an inner shell, um, the DNA, or the, sorry, the double-stranded RNA of the genome also being resolved. It essentially has this icosahedral symmetry, and so their theory is correct. Um, but of course, all symmetry is not perfectly isometric, and so you can also play with the same ideas uh, to come up with something which is more um, distorted, but nevertheless has the same core idealistic um, senses behind it. And in fact, the structure of the HIV capsid turns out to use that idea. It also, like icosahedra of an isometric form, has five pent sorry, has, has, has 12 pentagonal vertices, um, but uh, they're arranged in a different set of positions uh, to where you would find those 12 pentagonal vertices uh, in blue tongue virus, where they're arranged isometrically. And so in HIV, you get a distorted cone. And so you can see idealism too here is how people are playing with symmetry and ideas uh, of what would be fitting, um, and we'll come on to fit in a more general sense in a moment, to come up with theories which turn out to be correct for how it is that uh, nature is ordering itself chemically. And I want to go on to observation, and this relates directly to what Mylena was talking about. I want to say, first of all, something about poo sticks on the left-hand side. So poo sticks is here because I think that many experiments, if not all experiments, have a close relationship to play. And play, from my point of view, is an aesthetic experience. It's something that we enjoy and have delight in. And the reason why I choose poo sticks is because many of the kinds of experiments that, that I would do or colleagues of mine would do um, involve uh, taking our sample we want to study, placing it in some kind of medium, and exerting some kind of force on it, uh, such as, for example, Mylena referred to centrifugation used in the Mises and the Stahl experiment. What they did was that they centrifuged the DNA to separate it differentially, depending on how dense it was, and that is placing their DNA in water and gravitationally spinning it, and then you get movement of the thing, and you follow how it moves, and that tells you something about the structure of the DNA. Um, poo sticks is relevant because many of the systems that we study involve taking our system, placing it in a medium of different kind and applying force to it. And that is very playful, actually, and it feels very playful. There's an enjoyment in grappling with the experiment, and so that's why poo sticks is a good analogy. Um, the diamond light source down the road at the Harwell Research Campus, uh, Marlena also referred to the much larger experimental machinery we now use. The diamond light source is an example of one so such, such system. It's a, a very bright source of tunable x-rays. It's how you determine structures like the virus structure I showed in the previous slide. Uh, and again, there, there is delight in the design of huge machines with highly sophisticated physics behind them, which enable you to achieve the biological question, answering the biological questions you wish to. But we can observe more directly, and you can see a movie down here taking a take, taken using a technique called atomic force microscopy of a conformational change occurring in a protein that we work on as it, as it, as it in this case, um, attacks bacteria. And you can see that there's a clockwise movement uh, as it undergoes its conformational change, which is a brightening of the whole structure. So there's a delight in observation as well, uh, which I think feeds into our aesthetic experience in science. Another way in which um, uh, aesthetics comes into sight into the kind of um, data and nature uh, area um, that I want to talk about, and particularly in biophysics, is that we can represent our systems in ways which people commonly will find aesthetically pleasing. We can depict structures of proteins like this protein, this perforin protein forming a pore. We can, we can depict them as attractive ribbons. We can color them nicely. In a trivial sense, this is aesthetic, but people do kind of like it. They do 
warm to the representations that you can give you know and they will even sometimes ask you are they really that color and of course they're not really that color it's a way that enables us to try and depict an idea that we want to come across with but this is pulling together a whole load of data we've got into a movie which enables us to explain ourselves representation is another form of aesthetic process in this case expressive aesthetic kind of discourse if you like in um, biophysics and then form um, kind of pervades the issue of how we see beauty in nature and data. Um, the form of an alpha helix on the left-hand side there, um, the form of, um, of, in this case, the SARS-CoV-2 spike, um, which is the, is the bit of the protein that attacks our, our, um, our ACE2 proteins on human cells in order to insert into them. The forms which we might be able to relate to other forms in the world. So colleagues of mine studying the SARS-CoV-2 uh, spike noticed that the receptor binding domain uh, bore a resemblance to a, 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 a torso such as you might find in a Greek statue. And so that enabled them to organize their thinking as to where antibodies were binding and where the more powerful antibodies were binding. So you can see there's a kind of pooling together of different aesthetic senses in order to bring out some general ideas or some, some take-home messages that people wish people people wish others to, to understand from their work. And it's about the form of the, the form of the information and how we can display it. And then fit. I said I would mention fit, and this is kind of relates also to things like DNA, where clearly we're talking about the fitting together of two strands. But fit, and this for me was a, how I really got into a sense of the beauty uh, in science and really what led me to become a biochemist, the fit of molecules together, this molecule, something called EDTA, bound to a divalent cation, a metal ion, or the fit of drugs to target enzymes we might be trying to inhibit, and that's a structure of Paxlovid, which is a commercially marketed, it's now available in the clinic, inhibitor um, of the SARS-CoV-2 um, polymerase, and that is, you know, is now out there marketed, it's enabling people to better fight off the coronavirus, but what enabled that work to be done was solving structures and then aesthetically engaging with them and building models into those structures in order to um, understand how we could inhibit the enzyme and having inhibited then how we can uh, design more, more powerful drugs uh, in order to inhibit it better. And that's exactly what that paper describes. And finally, um, I think uniqueness is something which you find uh, as an aesthetic principle in general. There's the uniqueness of a single rose petal um, uh, the uniqueness of anything, you, uh, of anything um, isolated that grabs our attention in the, in the wider world. But I think in, in nature and data, in biophysics, there's a sort of uniqueness even to things which show no apparent order that you can easily perceive, no symmetry, but the, the unique complexity of something like the ribosome and the ways in which the bits of RNA and protein come together to form that structure um, are, it seems to me, another way in which aesthetics is experienced uh, by people uh, studying nature uh, with data, as it were. And so I've had these, these six kind of key ideas, idealism, observation, representation, form, fit, and uniqueness. They are all ways, different ways, practical ways in which I think aesthetics drives or is an experience engaged uh, with by scientists in, in na studying nature with data and doing biophysics. And if I had to group them all together in terms of what is going on, I think that the scientists are recognizing something when they see beauty in their data or find beauty in, in, their, in their experimental, or the experiment is showing them or the structure they determine. And also there is a delight that they have and this would apply to the experimental process as well as to the actual uh, results that you, you achieve and which delight you with their form, with their fit, with their uniqueness, the way they represent uh, a new understanding to you uh, and with the idealism that they might elicit from you as to how this system might work. And now I'll finish. I'm not a historian and I'm not a sociologist and I'm not a philosopher either. Um, I'm just your average theoretical physicist. And I guess the reason um, I ended up at this meeting is that I wrote a book, uh, which is called Lost in Math. And I apologize to the British part of the audience for the lack of an S. <laughs> Though, as you can see in the top right corner, the French, for some reason, used the English title in the British spelling. So um, this book is very much a personal story. It's my own story. Um, I was trying to figure out uh, what criteria I should use to pick a research topic. 
And my work has mostly been um, in the foundations of physics, um, by which I broadly speaking mean those areas where we're concerned with the really, really big questions, like questions like, what is time? How did the universe begin? What is matter made of? That kind of stuff. Um, so all of what I'm about to say is really about the foundations of physics, not about physics in, in general. Um, as you can see, the subtitle of the book was How Beauty Leads Physics Astray, um, and uh, writing a popular science book, so this was my first popular science book, has certainly been an interesting experience in that I found out there is a significant fraction of people who think that by reading the title of a book they can tell what comes in the 300 pages afterwards. A lot of those people got away with the idea that I'm saying Scientists shouldn't talk about beauty. Talking about beauty is bad, bad, bad. Don't do it. Now, I would like to think that the opinion that I expressed in the 300 pages that followed the title was a little bit more nuanced. Um, there are many reasons that scientists talk about beauty, and I'm certainly not saying all of them are bad. Like, we've, we've heard many of those reasons already. Um, for example, it's a motivation for them. It's an inspiration. It gets them into science. And um, I traveled around for my book and I interviewed a lot of uh, physicists and they brought up all kinds of uh, reasons for me, um, to me about why they um, like to talk about beauty. You can find them in the book. I'm, I'm going to pick one in particular, which um, already came up. So this is a quote from um, Germann, who won the Nobel Prize for um, the quark model. And he said uh, in a TED talk, what is especially striking and remarkable is that in fundamental physics, a beautiful or elegant theory is more likely to be right than a theory that is inelegant. And um, this might sound really familiar to you now, because you, if you remember Penrose's uh, quote, um, which came up in an earlier talk, was pretty much exactly the same. And I could go on like for half an hour <laughs> with quotes like this. It's a very, very common attitude that you find in, in uh, the foundations of physics. And I've grown up believing this because everybody says it. And you, um, I mean, when I say grow up, I mean grow up academically. <laughs> Um, it's like it's like really common that people tell you this, like that your sense of beauty is a good guide to the development of new models, to our understanding of nature. Um, and I, I, I this to me is kind of weird <laughs> that I stand here and say this today because it doesn't make any sense. You know, once you start thinking about it, you you begin to wonder why should it be the case. Right? Why can I use my sense of beauty to kind of magically figure out what's a good theory of nature? But I think the thing is that I never thought about it. It's just that so many people told me this, I never questioned it. And there, there are lots of problems connected to this um, because, as uh, Ben said in the very beginning, um, our notion of beauty dictates to some extent what kind of questions we even ask uh, and also what kind of answers. Um, we are willing to accept. Uh, in, in, in the foundations of physics in particular, um, what's happened is that pretty much everyone uses the same notion of beauty, and that leads them to discard a large number of theories, um, which, which is really a problem. And um, what's happening there is that we use this notion of beauty, which we um, have learned to identify in successful theories, and then we try to use it to develop new ones, but this keeps us getting stuck um, with the same type of theories and it's just not working. And I always refer um, people to um, James' uh, book about um, how the notion of beauty may change uh, with paradigms. Um, so it's a pleasure to finally meet him after I've referred to his book so many times. Um, there are many examples um, in the history of science and in physics in particular, where what's changed in a paradigm shift was actually our notion of beauty. Um, and he already said, um, quantum mechanics is an example, but there's also been um, the shift from a more mechanical worldview um, to one based on the notion of fields that extend through space. Um, or another example that most people are actually familiar with um, is the shift from cyclical orbits for the planets to elliptical orbits. 
And in all those cases, at the time, people thought that the new thing is really ugly. But today, um, physicists just accept it. It's just the way that it is. And I, I don't think they think about it as ugly. And so what happens if we insist on a particular type of beauty in the development of new models is that we get stuck. Um, so in, uh, in theoretical physics, our models are very, very mathematical and the type of beauty that theoretical physicists talk about um, is correspondingly um, basically mathematics. And I'm not going to explain exactly what I mean by those three hidden rules of physics, as I call them, um, they are basically technical mathematical requirements that people use in theory development. Um, and they are um, hypothesis, um, but their status um, as a hypothesis has become forgotten. Uh, and, and that's the problem. I think this is why we've uh, gotten stuck. I should maybe say that this notion of simplicity, which physicists use, is very strongly based on symmetry. So it, it probably has an evolutionary origin to some extent. We just find symmetry pleasing to look at. And we see this in the development of new models in the foundations of physics. And that has consequences. Um, there are lots of lots of theories and predictions that ha have come out of theoretical physics um, based on arguments from beauty, um, based on asking certain questions um, about the theories that we currently use. They have perceived shortcomings because they're not beautiful enough. And there are lots of um, particles that physicists have proposed to remedy this perceived lack of beauty in the theories that we have, axion supersymmetry, string theory, you've probably heard of this. Uh, WIMPs is a particular type of dark matter um, and uh, lots of other things that um, physicists have looked for in dozens and dozens of experiments and they haven't found anything. And I think, well, that's a problem. Um, so why do they do this? They're like this is, I still find this perplexing, I have to say, um, because it's once you start thinking about it, it doesn't make any sense. Like, why would you expect your personal notion of beauty to be a good guide to the development um, of new theories? So, um, and I think there are a number of uh, reasons for this. One is social reinforcement. I already talked about this um, briefly in the beginning. It's just you hear it so often and no one questions it that you just accept it as true, like the same way they are, that I accepted it um, as true. There's also a certain lack of philosophical grounding because if you actually were aware that it's a metaphysical requirement that has no backup in, in evidence, then you might question it more readily. There's also a lot of cherry picking history. Um, if you think of these quotes, which um, I mentioned, like um, the one from Gellman and from Penrose, and you could add many others, Feynman already came up. Uh, there's also um, Paul Dirac, um, you, you could add him, and uh, a lot of other people that you can add there. Frank Wilczek, for example, has written an entire book about um, beauty in, in the foundations of physics. What do all those people have in common, aside from being men? Yeah. <laughs> um, they've all won a Nobel Prize. So there's a certain selection bias. Um, we only take note of the people who have been successful and who then um, attribute their success to their sense of beauty. But in the history of physics, there have been lots of theories that were once considered beautiful that just didn't work. And on the other hand, there are lots of ugly theories that actually do work quite well. And finally, there's, uh, there are lots of cognitive biases um, for, for example, they just um, some people who I interviewed just said, "Well, if it's not beautiful, I don't want to work on it." <laughs> and I mean, who am I to blame them, right? But this um, um, is a very strong selection for the kind of theory that we work on. Work on. Okay, um, so I don't know about you, but I would certainly like to see progress in the foundations of physics in my lifetime, which brings up the question, well, what to do? But I think the most basic thing we can do is uh, to increase awareness among working scientists. Um, I think that to be a good scientist, one needs some 
a certain amount of knowledge about the history of science, the sociology, and the philosophy, which is why I think that events like this are really, really important. Thank you for your attention. So we've talked about um, you know the role of physics, uh, the role of truth and beauty in physics and biology, and the role of, of beauty in scientific theories and scientific experiments in in biology as well as in physics, and, and especially how in theoretical physics and fundamental physics uh, beauty could lead us astray. Uh, I've been reading some of this literature for the last few years, and and have been really trying to to think about well, there's an empirical question here, which is to what extent do scientists actually subscribe to some of these beliefs? To what extent do they share the perspectives of a Feynman or a Gelman? Or um, to what extent do they find the kind of delight in, in, in the kind of recognition, for instance, that, that Rob was talking about? And so I set out uh, to try to, um, to address this, this question through a, uh, a research project where we really wanted to get at, um, by the way, here are some more beautiful images from the James Webb uh, telescope, those of you who might recognize, they just came out. Um, I tried to, to get at, well, what, is, what does beauty mean to not Nobel Prize winners, but to ordinary scientists? Um, what, is, what, is, what does it mean to people? Where do they experience beauty? Is it really in the eye of, eye of the beholder? Is it idiosyncratic or are there patterns shared in, in disciplinary communities? Uh, how do scientists experience beauty as well as awe and wonder in their scientific work? And how do these experiences shape the practice of science, if at all? And what are the implications of these kinds of aesthetic experiences for things beyond theory choice? So do they, do they affect well-being, motivation, uh, recruitment, retention, and so on in science? So, so those are some of the kinds of questions I set out to answer. This large project that we call Work and Well-Being in Science um, it's a weird title, but the reason for the title, even though the focus of the study was principally on trying to understand the role of aesthetics in science, we didn't want to put aesthetics in the label of the study because we didn't want it to be biased towards only those who cared about aesthetics. So, um, so we included aesthetics as one of many things that we were studying. Uh, the study was carried out last year in 2021. Uh, it's a big survey in, in four countries, the US, UK, Italy, and India. There are a number of reasons why we chose these countries. Um, principally pragmatic. We had already been doing some research for a number of years and we had research teams there. They were diverse enough in terms of the R&D or dedicated towards science, the research infrastructure, cultures, and so on. Um, I can go into more details um, for those of you who like later on. And just to give you a sense of what we try to do, by scientists here, we just mean physicists and biologists. Sorry for you know, chemists and others. Uh, in the room, we just had to, you know, keep keep the study manageable, and we just, we just chose two disciplines, two core disciplines that, uh, as as Ben uh, told us at the beginning, have pretty interesting differences aesthetically that we thought would be worth exploring. Um, and and the the sample to which or the population to which we want to generalize, generalize is scientists working in PhD granting institutions and research institutes in physics and biology departments. So we got an entire list of all of these scientists, and then we sent out survey invitations to them. Nobody likes taking surveys, so we got 3,500 responses from about 22,000 scientists that we tried to invite. A number of universities um, uh, essentially blocked our study, so they did not believe that we're not spammers. And, and so it was really challenging to do this, this study, but we got a 15% response rate, and then we've weighted our results to that population, which we'll see in what follows. Um, and after doing these surveys, we also interviewed scientists. We interviewed 215 scientists in depth for about an hour to hour and 15 minutes uh, to gain their thoughts on this, on this matter. Uh, I won't spend too much time on the demographics, but just to give you an idea. So this is the distribution. We have, you know, 16% from the U.S., 27% from the U.K., 39% from India, 19% from Italy, 40% female, 52% physicists, and then this, you know, the distribution by position somewhat reflects the distribution in the in the population. Right? You know, so nearly forty something percent are graduate students. Um, and so the the analysis that I present to you are, are are weighted back to the population. So the first thing I want to look at is okay. So what do scientists mean by beauty? And to ask this question, we actually spent a couple of years doing uh, pilot work where we went and interviewed a number of scientists in these countries. And just ask them, what do you mean by beauty? And so, you know, we had some of the literature, the, the, the work that, that's, that Sabina had done and, and that James has done and so on. We also wanted to hear from scientists when, you know, have you encountered 
anything that you would consider beautiful or, 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 or what do you, what, what is the word beauty? What do you associate the word beauty with in your work? And they would give us various answers. And then we tried to, to collate them. And essentially we found three different types of beauty in, in their responses. And the first is what I would call sensory beauty. And so this is the, the kind of beauty of phenomena, the beauty of cells and stars and the beauty and of things they under, observe under the microscope, the beauty of even equations, uh, things they find pleasing or pretty. Uh, the second kind of beauty is, is useful beauty. That's the kind of thing that, that Zabin was talking about and James was talking about, which is the use of beauty, particularly in theory, as a heuristic, as a guide to truth, right? Um, but even in experimentation, we find scientists use beauty as, as a guide in the sense of designing an elegant experiment or certain kind of aesthetic principles are baked into the design of a, a good experiment. Um, and finally, the, the, the third kind is the beauty of understanding. And this resonates a little bit with what, what Rob was saying. When things come together, you recognize, ah, that's how this, that's how this mechanism works, right? So, um, so those three categories were emerged from... Um, a, a broader set of categories that we found. And so these are the kinds of things scientists would tell us that beauty means. The inner logic of systems, the hidden order or patterns that they observe, elegance, simplicity, complexity, symmetry, sense of fit, harmony, pleasing colors or shapes, and finally, asymmetry, very few. But still, many those who, those who did talk about asymmetry insisted this is really important, it's neglected. Um, but you see that the, the, the main category here has to do with this third type of beauty that I was talking about, the beauty of understanding or insight. Um, and then there are things like elegance and simplicity. And these things vary predictably by discipline, uh, just as, as Ben had talked about. Physicists care mainly about symmetry. And you can see that that first bar there is, is um, physics, right? So some 60 something percent of physicists find beauty in symmetry, whereas some uh, nearly 70% of bi uh, biologists find beauty in, in uh, or sorry, in, if, if, sorry, this is um, the wrong thing I'm looking at. Uh, complexity is the other thing I was, I was comparing it to. You have physicists who find beauty in, in symmetry and simplicity and biologists who find more beauty in complexity. Right? So those are the kinds of disciplinary differences that are really uh, striking. Uh, biologists also tend to find more beauty in pleasing colors or shapes compared to physicists. But both physicists and biologists equally find beauty in this third kind of uh, third type of beauty, the hidden order or the inner logic of systems. So the beauty of insight, of recognizing what's going on behind things seems to be uh, especially important uh, and pervasive. The second question is where in their work do scientists encounter beauty? So these are the things that they find beautiful, but where do these things emerge? Uh, principally, it's in the phenomena that they study. So 75% of scientists say they encounter beauty, however they define it, in cells and particles and so on, 61% in theories, 54% in teaching, 52% in the process of research, and the rest of it is less uh, prominent. Um, almost all of these categories were equally uh, likely uh, to be expressed by physicists and biologists, except for two of them, which is not surprisingly scientific theories. More physicists find beauty in scientific theories than biologists do. So that's like 73% of physicists and 49% of biologists find beauty in scientific theories. And then the writings of prominent scientists, uh, that's the only other area where 40% of physicists compared to 31% of biologists uh, found those uh, beauty in, in those those areas. Um, what we don't really see very much of is, is beauty in scientific workplaces. For instance, uh, many complain to us about working in horrible labs in basements without windows and so on. Um, and uh, that raises some interesting questions about well-being that they brought up themselves. I'll give you a couple of examples from our interviews about the kinds of beauty they, they experienced. One told us, if you look under the microscope, there are experiments that are more exciting because there's a visual aspect to it. And it's interesting, to, it's exciting to see a cell responding under the microscope compared to having just a graph. Even though the graph, the quantification is equally, if not more important, um, it's not as satisfying. So, so seeing structures unfold under the cell, that's, that's beautiful, right? Or putting together these amazing, now this is again, beauty in, in the equipment, right? So not, not even just obser observation, but in their equipment, um, these detectors, and that's, you know, this is one scientist talking about the devices that they put together as, as being beautiful. And so there's, there's numerous arenas in which scientists encounter beauty, from their theories to their data, to, to nature, to, to the actual objects that they're using. 
and how frequently do, do such experiences occur? So we'll ask them a lot of questions about, you know, ranging from never to, you know, a few times a year to monthly, weekly, daily. So we give them those sorts of options, ask them a number of questions. Um, and we see that certain kinds of, of aesthetic experiences are pretty frequent. So at least a few times a year, 86% of scientists said that they felt pleased by the elegance of a scientific object. Uh, 86% also, also were thrilled by a new insight, at least a few times a year. 83% felt their research opened up new mysteries. There's a Feynman quotation uh, here. He talks about uh, a, you know, a, an argument with an artist friend of his who complained to him that you physicists, you just reduce things. You don't understand the beauty of a flower. Feynman would say, I, I know the deeper structures of a flower and therefore I have greater aesthetic experience. And so science, the science knowledge doesn't reduce, but it only enhances the, the sense of mystery. And so this is the, 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 the sense that most scientists see several times a year, the sense of mystery opening up. 81% uh, felt a sense of childlike delight, delight or joy, as, as, as Rob was talking about during their work. 68% felt pleased by encountering symmetry in scientific equations, models, or data. So not just physicists, even biologists find some, some delight in symmetry. Um, and 66% and were pleased by the surprising discovery of a hidden order or deeper systems. Right? So these things occur somewhat frequently in, in scientific life. And so you have these aesthetic experiences. When are they relevant? When are they important in science? Um, there are a number of, of interesting differences between physicists and, bi and biologists here. Um, where, where they are, where they share commonalities are when they present or communicate scientific results and when they analyze or interpret scientific results, right? So communication, interpretation, aesthetic criteria matter equally to physicists and biologists. Where you have some differences are biologists seem to find more uh, beauty more relevant in the design of a project, in making observations in the lab or in the field, in developing a project plan or grant applications, whereas physicists tend to find beauty more commonly in writing code and in doing theoretical calculations, right? So there are some differences and some similarities again. Uh, I'll give you a couple of examples. As one biologist told us, I try to make our experimental design as elegant and as direct as possible, which for me is a form of beauty because the less effort we put into getting an answer, the better, the faster, the cleaner, the fewer different parameters, the more convincing and clean the information will be, right? So you intentionally wa don't want to design a messy and ugly experiment um, is, is what, what we learned. Beauty is also socialized and communicated in scientific disciplinary communities uh, in a number of ways. So a number of scientists said that they pay attention to aesthetic aspects of their colleagues' work. 55% uh, uh, say they care about aesthetics at things like conferences or discuss what they find beautiful in science with their colleagues and students. Uh, fewer scientists said that they've changed their minds about what counts as beauty during their career or that they heard their supervisors refer to aesthetic aspects of science. One of the things you got to take with a grain of salt is this is all self-report. I don't know how self-aware these scientists are of how often they're, you know, uh, being uh, aesthetic factors are being communicated to them by their colleagues and so on. And so the question of cognitive bias is it's not something that self-reported data is very good at actually getting at. Right. We don't we don't really know how much uh, cognitive bias there is in science and, and people are uh, rarely capable of recognizing it in themselves. Um, and okay, so what? So what are the consequences then of encountering beauty in science? Well, we talked about motivation. 62% of scientists say that encountering beauty motivated them to share the beauty of science. Similar percentage said that it uh, motivated them to pursue a scientific career. 57% say that beauty, encountering beauty improves their scientific understanding. Um, so it's an asset to, to understanding. 50% say it helped them persevere when they experience difficulties or failure, motivates them to communicate science to their public. Um, the places where you find some differences disciplinarily are uh, more physicists are likely to say that encountering beauty gives them confidence in their results compared to biologists. And similarly, more physicists are, are likely to say that encountering beauty makes them think that they're on the right road to reach truth in their investigation. Right? So there seems to be um, a greater sense among physicists that beauty is, is a reliable guide to truth. Um, again, in terms of consequences, one, one of the researchers we talked to told us, I don't think you really enter academia unless you've had that sense of encountering beauty. This is a bit of a rat race. The whole time you have to be struck 
by the beauty of all of it, either the process or just the universe or whatever. Otherwise, you wouldn't do this. Why would you do all this? And this is one of the things that actually motivated my own study is, is in a previous research project, we heard scientists telling us that what made their work worthwhile was we don't get paid very much. There's a lot of political bullshit to put up with. Uh, we do it because it's beautiful. And I wanted to know, well, how pervasive is that sentiment? And this is an attempt uh, to try to understand that. Okay, so how do scientists then evaluate the role of beauty in science? Um, and for this one, we, we pulled out the theoretical physicists just to get a sense of uh, whether they were any different. And so we have theoretical physics, other physics, and then biology. And, and here we see there's no difference in answering the question of science helps us better access the beauty that actually exists in the world. This is a kind of claim that Frank Wilczek seems to be making. Um, it is important for scientists to encounter beauty, awe, and wonder in their research. So you've got you know, somewhat around 70% or so of scientists seem to believe those things, that beauty is really important and it helps us access uh, beauty in the world. Um, now, when it comes to things like a good theory or experiment needs to be elegant, Gelman. Uh, theoretical physicists are a bit more likely. Now, you know, our sample of theoretical physicists is small, so that error bar doesn't allow us to be confident in, in some of those distinctions. But certainly when it comes to the idea that um, a beautiful or elegant theory is more likely to be correct than a theory that is inelegant, that's Gelman again, uh, definitely physicists, uh, theoretical or not, believe that much more than biologists do. Um, the idea that mathematical beauty is a good indicator of scientific truth, again, physicists are more likely than biologists to believe that. The pursuit of aesthetic considerations like symmetry and elegance is bad for scientific progress. There's equally uh, only about 10% uh, across disciplines seem to think that it's a bad thing, even though they seem to be suspicious of it, right? So they, they're not entirely sure that beauty is reliable, but they don't think it's bad either. Um, here, these are questions we asked only of physicists because in our pilot study, when we tried to ask them of biologists, they laughed at us and said that those questions are silly. So, so these questions uh, that society should invest more, more resources to pursue unified theory of physics. Um, of course, biologists wouldn't really seem to care about that. Uh, but you know, there's a bit of difference between theoretical physicists and others. Here's the huge difference. In scientific models and theories, I consider numbers that are much larger or smaller than one to be ugly. I think that's the naturalness factor that, that Zabina talked about. So very clearly theoretical physicists care about that much more than other physicists. Not much difference in their opposition to Dirac's claim that it is more important to have beauty in one's, experiment, one's uh, equations than to have them fit experiment. So um, only, only about 10% or so of physicists uh, agreed with that claim and about something like 80% disagreed with, with Dirac on that point. Um, so I'm gonna stop there. There are a few other considerations and I'm happy to talk about them later. For instance, we find an important link between aesthetics and well-being in science and, and differences uh, across positions. So graduate students are much more likely to experience uh, aesthetic experiences in science, or at least they experience it, aesthetic experiences in beauty more frequently than, than scientists across the, their career stages. And there's a, a, an interesting sort of, um, u shape little bit of a, a u shaped curve that across the scientific career, you, the beauty gets beaten out of you by the institutional factors that are in science. But I'll stop there for now. And uh, I think what we'll do is have the panelists come up and chat about what we just talked about. And, and then we'll open it up to Q&A. Thank you all. Maybe we could put Milena up on, on the screen so she can join us as well. And we could... Um, we could probably all, yeah, if all the panelists might come up here and then we can see if, if you all have any questions for each other. Um, I'm curious to know if, if any of these data um, have raised new questions or new ideas for you all, um, or if you have ideas that you want to riff off each other as questions or comments. This is a bit unusual with Mela up there, but that's fine. We can see you, so that works. I, I for one, will be very interested in... Well, let's get the microphone so we can... Yeah. Yeah. As I, for one, uh, it's, it's up, up, of course, our chair, but I would be very interested in, in, in hearing uh, uh, comments from, uh, from, from the audience. Absolutely, maybe, yeah, we're going we're gonna to open it up in just a second, but I just wanted to know if people had any, any questions for each other on your, on your presentations and... Any well, reflections? All, all I'd say is I just commented as I did in my talk that I thought it was a very happy a confluence of ideas among all of us, actually, I would say. I think this emphasis on the, the human and the personal 
perspective, I think is is and the experiential and the way in which things are just found to work and that is found to link to aesthetic experience or response it does seem to be something that's a common thread and that's a, a nice thing to, to find. Um, but I, I also, I think it's very good to be warned about the fact that it's the successful people who speak <laughs> and it's the Nobel Prize winners who, who have their quotes banded around and, and that elegance isn't always going to the truth, but that's just one comment. Yeah. I, I was wondering, James. I mean, I you know when you were talking about the success of theories, uh, I, I, you know, Zavina's made this point too that there's also the the socialization process in science where you are in an institutional environment. So, so perhaps I, I wonder if you know it's not just the success or track record of a particular theory, but also the sort of social dynamics of people wanting to go where the money is, wanting to go where there's funding, um, and then people with funding want to protect themselves and not have any threats to, to that, uh, you know, that particular line of inquiry. You know, so, so people have complained that string theory has, has been for perhaps too long, too well-funded, and, and, and uh, critiques were you know, perhaps not as, uh, I don't know, not, not as difficult to, to or sorry, it was, it was not as, as easy to challenge some of those sorts of ideas. Um, so I wonder what, what you think the role of not just uh, rationality, but also some of those other factors like institutional resources and, and um, uh, you know, imitation and wanting to be like the successful people and not just uh, imitate successful ideas. Might play, yeah. Uh, thanks a lot, yes. Um, well, I would, I would make two points. The first is that um, this inductive process is very largely uh, socially implemented. It's not an induction that, that one uh, conducts in the, the privacy of one's study. It's something that is uh, mediated by the academic community, the, the particular scientific community. And it's also um, carried out and, and transmitted largely in the form of uh, training. So it's a large part of your training that you are socialized to find uh, certain theories and approaches aesthetically attractive. Uh, so that's certainly one heading in which the social process is important. Uh, you, of course, mentioned uh, some more, more complex uh, processes, uh, follow the money, uh, invitations, and so on. Uh, I would respond to that, that um, if the uh, scientific, uh, the, the branch of science in question is well organized uh, and uh, truth apt, then that sort of thing uh, does or at least should uh, attract empirical success too. Uh, so it may well be, as, as a sociologist, you may well tell me, no, no, prizes are awarded on a quite different basis, uh, invitations are awarded on a quite different basis, and so on. But if, if it's run in a truth as a truth apt uh, enterprise, then we're giving our, our top prizes to the people whose, whose theories in a sense, uh, that's not the only reason, but if they are theoreticians th 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 whose theories have a certain track record of empirical success. And so it, it all comes right in the end. Maybe I can add something. Um, I think part of the drive towards beauty, uh, especially in, in the very theoretical parts of physics, is kind of baked into the way that we, we decide whether something is successful. Um, because most often um, when you're trying to get something published um, or you're trying um, to get something funded, it depends very strongly on how many people like your work. And physicists like beautiful theory. So if you're working on something that's perceived as beautiful, whether or not it's empirically adequate, it makes it more likely that other people also want to work on it. And that makes your life much, much easier. And I think that's certainly one of the reasons why um, ideas like string theory um, and supersymmetry um, have carried on so much because people just like to work on it because it's beautiful. If you want to just introduce yourself, just tell us your name, where you're from. Uh, yeah. Hey, I'm Kavir. I'm a a uh, philosophy student uh, here in Oxford. So, I mean, uh, just a quick question, uh, I think directly related to one of the uh, surveys that you showed, uh, and this to everyone in the panel and what their thoughts are. I think what I was interested in, there's a very nice asymmetry between, uh, between beauty and good science. So I think you showed that, oh, uh, around like 80% of biologists and physicists believe that science helps us 
appreciate beauty or there's an implication from good science to beauty but uh, the other other way around from beauty to science that's like around 10% so there's a very stark asymmetry so uh, yeah what's 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 going on there in some sense because you would think, think that oh if around like 80% 85% of scientists think that uh, science uh, good science or at least good science gives you some grasp of beauty then the reverse implication that something which is not beautiful is not maybe good science that's that also holds even if the other direction doesn't hold so what's 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 going on there in some sense so i mean i, I think so essentially the the two uh uh ideas there was one one was that there is essentially there's objective beauty in the world and science can help us better understand that and so like i think the quote from Wilczek is that the natural world embodies beautiful ideas and so um or um yeah, I think um, you know a number of scientists have basically said that that science gives us access to you know it helps us to better understand the things that we find beautiful, right? So uh, that's because it gives us more knowledge into things. Whereas the other idea uh, was was that uh, beauty matters much more than experimentation. I, I think that so that the one that had just the ten percent agreement. So it's enough for your equations to be beautiful. And my thought with Dirac, I mean, Dirac is a strange man, but I thought, I thought uh, you know, he was essentially very confident that the math- mathematics will eventually be proven experimentally. Um, I'm not quite sure why. So I think, I mean, maybe Sabino, you might have a better idea or, or others might as to, as to what gives them confidence that even if experimental data today don't seem to corroborate with these beautiful equations, don't worry, just be patient, give it another 50 or 100 years and a few more billion dollars, and, and then you'll eventually see that I'm right. And it's happened at times. There were times that physicists, I think, t- you know, stuck to their guns, even though experimental data initially did not support them. And then eventually the experiments proved to have been mistaken. They're like, see, we told you our, our beautiful equations held out. I, don't, I think you might have a better explanation for, for why uh, there's that confidence in, in, in beauty, even if experimental data may initially not support it, but, but that, that's only held by a very small minority of physicists. And I don't, I don't know why they would hold to that. So I'm not, I'm not entirely sure I correctly understood the question. Let me just try to say it in my own words. Is the question like, if you ask scientists, um, does a good theory have to be beautiful? They'd say like, yeah, well, maybe I'm not perfectly convinced. But if you ask them, would you accept an ugly theory? Um, they would say like, no. <laughs> Basically, this discrepancy between the answers. I, I saw that there was an asymmetry between scientists saying that science helps us appreciate beauty or makes, I mean, makes, makes us appreciate beauty in some sense. That was the first. But there was another kind of uh, survey statistic that you showed, which said that uh, whether beauty helps us track truth or track whatever the enterprise of science is. And that was also quite, that was quite low throughout, throughout, the, throughout, throughout biologists and physicists. So there is this asymmetry, right? Because uh, many people, the vast majority think that uh, science can lead to, lead to appreciation of beauty, but really not, not many people think that beauty can lead to whatever the aim of science we take it to be, whether truth or empirical adequacy or so on and so forth. So there's this asymmetry and it seems, uh, well, I don't know if it seems surprising or not. Well, so they would say to me that beauty can help with scientific understanding. So beauty, they, they do say there's a, quite a few, like more than more than like nearly 60 percent say that beauty helps with scientific understanding. Um, where they would disagree is that beauty is a guide, a reliable guide to truth. And they would say that it's um, in, in many ways, I think, echo- echoing your cautions, maybe they've, they've all read your book because, like, you know, I was surprised to find that uh, some of those statistics were so low. Um, they seem very reticent, even in their interviews, they would say, yeah, beauty could be a guide. And, you know, even at Ben, as you say at the end, it's, it's not, you know, beauty can mislead us. And they, scientists seem aware of that by and large, uh, that just relying on beauty isn't going to do it. And uh, yeah. can I just ask something, uh, I'm Sorry. kind of joining as well. I'm not sure whether I should just jump in and interrupt. Please, yes. It's awkward. But yes, thank you very much for the question. And I was just thinking about the fact that you don't have to have a true theory to appreciate nature, right? We've appreciated nature for a lot of past false theories. And if you think about experiments, like you can appreciate that 
kind of an experiment where you're doing something with combustion and think, my goodness, this is looking amazing and it's helping me engage in the beauty of nature. Uh, if you're thinking this is about phlogiston being released, you have a very false theory and you still are engaging very much aesthetically with what's going on in nature. And so I think there are two very different things, right? The fact that, yes, systematically approaching a phenomenon that is natural through science is one thing. Of course, we're going to find more people thinking that this is where, you know, the, the beauty is engaging with nature in this way than actually saying the much more substantial epistemologically claim that beauty then in, in our theory guarantees or gives higher likelihood for us to be correct in the kind of answers we're giving. Right? So I think, I think it's different ways in which we're applying the concept. And in, in one, it's just engagement and perhaps trying to gain understanding. And the other is much more substantial. It's unsurprising, I think, that there's a lot more caution with the second kind of question. Thank you. Great. Um, let's do it. Sure, sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. I just, I just think it's also worth reflecting that it's, it's possible that the experience of beauty isn't so much um, a driver as a symptom of something else, which is that um, it's actually a symptom of the deep engagement of the scientists with whatever it is they're studying. And so I, and personally, that's, that's really kind of where I find myself, actually, that it's more of a symptomatic thing. We experience beauty because we put our heart into it. And when you put your heart into something, you throw yourself at it, that's how you get a full understanding of it. And that means that you learn to love it or you learn to, and you learn to find it beautiful. And this relates also to what Ben was saying and others that actually I think there is something, of course there's something adaptive about what we find beautiful and it's to do with our experience. And it's a symptom, that beauty experience of beauty is a symptom of what we're doing, which is throwing ourselves at it and opening ourselves to it. So I just think that's relevant to the question. I think people are kind of perhaps being a little bit self-critical and thinking, well, I shouldn't use beauty as a guide to the truth. But actually, I suspect they very often do find, as it happens perhaps by chance, that the things turn out to be true. They do think are beautiful, but I think it's because they've put their all into it to find out what they needed to find. So I just... Oh, could I say something as a follow-up yeah. on that, then? Um, I think that it's interesting that you mentioned, like Dirac, for example, you would think that that very, very highly refined mathematical sensibility, very, very logical, if you like, also comes coupled to this very intuitive feeling this non-rational part which it, which is much more emotional if you like and in some people those two things are sort of very very closely intertwined that there's such a deep feeling that this has to concord with the truth i think partly because it, it it's the engagement with the mathematics generates a kind of love for the mathematics and i mean i think that there is I wouldn't really know how to approach the problem, but there has to be a really deep biological basis for this. Like, and I think it might not even be uh, purely a human response. Like Jane Goodall, the primatologist, talks about watching chimpanzees as they investigate a waterfall and conjecturing that they're experiencing a sense of awe when they see this thing, which is a marvel of nature. They adapt their behavior and they start to engage with it and they start to explore it. Uh, and so she conjectures, well, they, have a, they are experiencing something like what we would describe as awe. Now, it has a purpose, though. It means that they engage with that thing and they explore it and they come to know it. So you could see that there's a kind of benefit to that, like evolutionarily. And also in terms of science, that it really draws you into things. And it's not really a rational response. It's something different to that. And you could easily see how those two things could be beneficial in some circumstances and highly non-beneficial in other circumstances and very, very hard to disentangle because the one side of it is much more of an emotional response than the other, but sometimes they get intertwined. Yeah. And I, I mean, I don't know about the high energy physics area, but I, I can kind of see that how that could happen very easily with very particular sensibilities like, you know, Dirac's for instance, and if they're held up as the, the sort of ultimate in that particular discipline or that particular area, and there are additional social uh, uh, biases imposed, you know, for instance, like the quote I gave from Feynman, where he says, inexperienced students. Well, if you're a graduate student learning, feeling your way into that community, you're not going to question that. I mean, you'll just sort of pick that up and take it into yourself 
and it becomes internalized to such an extent that you can't really even maybe rationalize it to yourself. Yeah, no, I think that's, that's yeah, important factors. We've got a lot of questions coming in, hands up as well. So let me, let me ask for, um, maybe I'll start collecting questions. I know Leticia has her hand up or Leticia, uh, feel free to write your question in the chat. We have a question from Deepshika. Uh, do you think the commonality of beauty across scientific disciplines might be indicative of a higher intelligence or power? Let me collect a couple. Sir, from you, you had your hand up there and then, and then yourself. And we'll collect three questions and then we'll jump to. Hi, I'm Jeremy Gibbons. I'm a computer scientist. I was asked, wondering about the, the, this asymmetry. Um, so uh, Gilman and um, Penrose was saying that uh, a, a true theory must be beautiful. If it's, if it's ugly, then it's not true. Um, but the, 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 the other side is that is Dirac's side, which is a beautiful theory must be true. And, and that's, that's the controversial one, perhaps. That's the one in the sense in which beauty is not a, um, a reliable guide for you. Lots of beautiful theories have been slain by ugly facts. So is, is, I wonder if that was this, the asymmetry that's, uh, that's, that's coming out. So, so beauty is a characteristic of, of true things, but not all beautiful things are true. Right, it's, it, it can also be a characteristic of, of false theories. Uh, so um, I will give an illustration to set me up for, to set up the question. It might be a, a little bit funny of illustration, but it will set set up nice. Uh, so uh, I always find um, newborn babies to not be very um, beautiful. Okay, but a mother will always find the baby to be beautiful, to, to her baby to be beautiful. Now. Uh, it might be because she recal recalibrates her uh, sense of beauty. I, I don't know. But uh, as the second talk, as the second talk um, uh, led me to think, is that uh, no matter what the final, if there is a final uh, theory uh, of physics, be no matter what the theory is, we will always find it beautiful. No matter what, is this the case? Sounds like the conclusion to your book. <laughs> uh, feel free to, to address any of those questions. Anyway, yeah. Um, yeah. Well, yeah. So um, this is kind of how, how my book ends. <laughs> so in the end, I explain I got a new research grant and I'll work on something, and we will come to find it beautiful. So this a lot of people were really confused why I said this, but it was exactly this point that I was trying to get across, like whatever we will find, if it's correct, we will come to find it beautiful. Um, I, I should also um, add something to what you said earlier before I forget about this. Um, a lot of physicists who I talk to who are not in science communication tend to not think about the stuff as beauty to begin with. There are certain mathematical criteria that they use, like unification, for example, the search for a theory of everything, uh, naturalness, and so on. But they don't necessarily put it down uh, as beauty. This is really something you, you find in popular science writing and that kind of stuff. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, very interesting questions. Um, one thing that I would say I think in answer to both. Uh, so one of the contributions that I've tried to make is to relativize um, the category of, of beauty uh, with respect to history. Uh, I think in, in general, it's a mistake to think that uh, given all the, the, the uh, theories in history of science, uh, there are some, there's one subset that, that are strikingly beautiful and another subset that's perhaps strikingly ugly and, and these categories never change. Um, to my mind, uh, what, what counts as beautiful, what is hailed as beautiful, is, is highly plastic historically. Uh, and so to some extent that, that solves, if, if you accept this principle, that solves both, both the problems. Um, it's, it's not the case that we're trying, we, we have this enormous uh, coincidence that it's the beautiful theories that, that turned out to be true and the true theories are true. There's an underlying mechanism there. Uh, as regards your question, I, I think the, the question of babies is a little bit different, um, just as the question of uh, art, fine art, the sort of art on, on the walls here, that there's also a 
sense in which that's beautiful, but I think that's also a different case. I've, I've myself, I've never uh, suggested that I had a theory of everything in terms of uh, all aspects of, of beauty. So I think I'll put babies in another category. Um, but uh, it, it is the case, just as Sabina said, I think that uh, a theory of everything that's, um, that's endorsed uh, wholeheartedly is going to be a very successful theory. And so we'll reshape the aesthetic canons, whether at first we thought the theory was ugly or not. And so there is this inevitability of it. The better a theory is, given enough time, uh, the more it's going to center or, 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 or retune our aesthetic sensibilities, especially in that scientific uh, community, in order to make itself beautiful. Uh, so this is not a case of the ugly duckling that turns beautiful. It's largely a case of the aesthetic canons that are reshaped under the impact of, of the empirical performance. That, in any case, that's how I see it. And, and, and just briefly, um, and relating to the question that was asked on the screen from Deep Shikha Sharma uh, about whether the, uh, which Brandon, you, you read out, didn't you? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, wh whether the commonality of experience of beauty indicates the existence of a higher power. Um, I, I'm sure I'm pretty certain every one of us will have a different answer on this if we chose, to, if we wanted to go around. What I would say is I personally, and I, I'm actually an Anglican priest as well as the things that, that Brandon said about me at the beginning. So clearly I do have a commitment to, to a belief in God personally. But, um, but what I would say is, I, I think what I would strongly want to affirm is it, it, it emphasizes the importance of the spiritual as a human experience. I think the human experiences are fundamentally spiritual, love for one another is a spiritual experience and I think that the fundamental importance of the spiritual however one understands that within a human life uh, is under is is indicated by this I would suggest well I would also just comment um uh relating also to this question is that a comment was made earlier about this uh, particular by Zabina about uh, issues around uh, why should our minds fit these um, our understanding of the world, why should the beautiful theories we enjoy fit the way the world is? Now, of course, that does relate to a whole area of argument about the existence of God, uh, where you get very different points of view. Thomas Nagel, an atheist philosopher, thinks that question is very important, that has a, a, a non-theistic answer of a kind. Um, and then um, there's a whole school of people who would try and say, well, the fact our minds fit the way the world is does suggest that we're made in the image of God. That's not what I'm saying, uh, but that is a point of view that is... That is, that is um, that is that is put out there, but as I say, I would say that it underscores the value of the spiritual as a general idea, because human lives are spiritual, basically. Could I could I jump in? Uh, yeah, on please, man. Yes. The question as well. So just a slightly different way of, of answering this last question, and actually going back to something that Ben said about um, how we experience nature. I think you can give an evolutionary answer as to why we feel very happy when we find beauty in nature, but also very happy when our explanations are really elegant and you know, we find symmetry. It's because we, we're processing information in this way. And it's easier to process information when things are very neat. And this perhaps, you know, these, this kind of, you know, call them biases, call, call them cognitive constraints on our own kind of ways of, in which we process information from the out world uh, is basically reflective of this. So the experiences of beauty that we have and these constraints we put into the kinds of explanations we want, the kind of experience, experiments we want to run, perhaps are just reflecting of these cognitive capacities that we have, the very specific cognitive capacity. And as Ben said earlier, you know, it pays off to be able to spot stuff in the world, like to be able to spot patterns because you will avoid predators, you will survive, you know, to when you're spotting symmetries and patterns together. Um, and it pays off to find your baby beautiful because it means they will survive. So another way of thinking about it, not indicating anything to do with higher powers, but just reflecting our own capacities and the human kind of condition of how we process information and perhaps the aesthetic experiences we have are just either very deeply in, in, ingrained in our understanding or maybe just byproducts of that understanding of that cognitive success that we achieve. Thank you. Yeah, I think it is interesting that the type of, of aesthetic experience that is shared by um, most scientists is, is around insight, right? So it's not the symmetry or the complexity, but it's that ability to grasp the, the inner workings of the inner logics of things um, and so, yeah, I think there are those, certainly those theological arguments about if, 
if we delight in, in the grasping of logic, then there must be maybe a source of that logic. Um, but, I, but I think also, I mean, the question is, is interesting. In our data, we find there's really no, we, we actually have a little bit of data on the religiosity of scientists. Uh, there's no relationship between the religiosity of scientists and their uh, frequency of, of experiences of beauty or wonder. There is, however, a relationship between scientists' um, sense of spirituality, as they, as they call it, uh, and and their frequency of experiencing awe. So the more you experience uh, awe, the more important you would consider spirituality in your life as a scientist. But when it comes to beauty, there's really no difference, at least in our in our data, with uh, any kind of religious variable. And, and I'll just add that it's just that to follow from Marlene that um, whatever, despite what I said about human beings have a spiritual aspect, which is about meaning in our lives, basically, I also believe it's all evolved, of course, and it's all clearly environmentally factored both during our own lives as we evolve as individuals and shape our experiences, and obviously by the fact that we're evolved animals. Yeah. Well, I want to uh, recognize that we've reached our, our time, certainly we're after uh, six here, so uh, please do stick around for uh, refreshments and Q&A with our speakers, and, and please join me in thanking all of our, our panelists today, uh, and, and thank you all for joining us. Hey, everyone. Thanks for watching. If you liked that video, please hit that thumbs up button and share it with your friends. Also, please take a second to hit the subscribe button because it really helps us out.